Our uh, speaker today is one of our board members. He will speak on uh, early threshing and manufacturing in Battle Creek, Rob Gillespie. Well, as you can see, I'm all wired up here, so <laughs> hopefully you can, you can hear. <laughs> uh, it, it's hard to believe that Battle Creek completely changed the way agriculture was done in the world, I mean globally. At one point, the companies in Battle Creek had 10% of the global agricultural equipment market. And that's pretty staggering when you think of uh, what that really, really means. Uh, and there were three main companies here in Battle Creek, and they all played pivotal roles in the beginning of this equipment. So that's kind of what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about, first of all, threshers, and later on, uh, kind of an outgrowth of that, and that's the steam traction engines to power the threshers. So that's kind of where we're, where we're headed with all of this. So what is threshing? Well, threshing's been around since the beginning of civilization. It goes back to the, the, the pharaohs in ancient Egypt 5,000 years ago. And if you ever see a picture of one of the, the pharaohs, they're always depicted holding a shepherd's crook and a flail. And the flail is what you use for threshing. And that, up until about 1830, was the only way you, you did threshing. So mechanizing that was uh, kind of an important thing to do. Uh, basically, threshing is simply trying to remove the, the grain from the straw, from, from all of the support material of the, uh, of the uh, uh, product. But it really entails a lot of things uh, along the way. It's reaping, it's threshing, it's separating, and it's winnowing. All those processes have to occur to end up with grain uh, that's, that's free of the straw and the, the chaff and all of that. Traditionally, uh, it was always done with some kind of a, first a hand sickle, then a sigh, uh, so you could at least stand, but think of how backbreaking that had to be to just keep swinging that thing all day. And the big invention in the 1700s was to add a cradle to the, the sigh so it would help so every load, every swing would get stacked a little bit. It was easier to collect them. During the, the early 1800s, the sickle bar type of cutter was starting to be invented. Everybody was playing with it. And eventually, this is what it evolved to into the uh, mid-1800s. But the problem with this type of a mower is that it, it didn't work well on grain type crops because it just let the stalks fall anyway whatsoever and it knocked a lot of the grain off. So it kind of defeated the purpose. But Cyrus McCormick, after his father had worked on it for years, he finally came up with a reaper uh, in uh, the official date is 1831, although it's really kind of a transitional thing. And what he did was took a sickle bar cutter, put it here at the front leading edge of the machine, and then put kind of a, a windmill type looking thing on it to make sure that the grain all laid down flat in the same direction. Pretty simple idea, but it made all the difference. So you've got a horse with one man tending the horse, another man raking off the, the uh, grain as it's cut. And um, can you imagine doing that on the Great Plains? I mean, doesn't it look intimidating when you look at the horizon line? But look at all the people that are involved here. You've got a man tending the horse, a man raking the grain off the, the, off the board. Uh, you've got a couple people then picking up the piles, tying them into to bundles, into sheaves, and then other people uh, putting the sheaves all together into a shock. So a lot of labor was still going on. In fact, harvest time accounted for 25% of all the man hours spent on a farm every year. And this was only a two or three week time period. So this was labor intensive. So anything you could do to cut down on the labor was important. So this was kind of the first step. The windmill got turned into these hay rakes, still did the same thing, but it now uh, dumped it all out in a nice windrow. So notice you've got one man instead of two men, but notice it took a little more power to pull this thing. So instead of one horse, they were up to two horses. 
but uh, and you can see that the power was supplied by what they call a power ground wheel. So there was no engine involved, it just was the, the turning of the wheel that, that did the work. The next step in all of this was, well, let's get rid of another guy. So now it, it not only did the reaping, it did the, the uh, wind rowing right on the machine and tied it up and spit out a, a, a sheave ready to pick up. Notice we're down to one man, but now notice we're up to two oxen. The power requirement's gone up. So as the machinery got more complicated and got bigger, it took more power. And then, of course, you still had all the people running around, picking up the sheaves, throwing them on the wagon. And now you could finally get past this reaping part and start doing some threshing. So it went back to the, went back to the thresher, bringing in the sheaves. No, notice how so many early Christian hymns all revolve around agricultural things. No mistake that that, that was uh, no, no coincidence. Well, this is the flail. It's just a handle with a kind of a segment about that long on it, and you just beat on the grain till it knocked the, the, uh, the grain off the, the straw. And this is where it was important that it was all laid out in one direction. Notice they've got a guy back here. He's laying all the, the straw out, and notice how all the heads are at one end. This way you didn't have to beat the whole thing. You just had to beat the part where the head was. So it, it was part of trying to make it easier. But look at, you're just whacking at this stuff all day with these things. This is, this is pretty backbreaking labor. And then once you've got it all um, broken down, you've still got everything mixed together, the straw, the bits, the chafe, the grain. So now you've got to start separating the straw. Some of it you just kind of get out with your, your pitchfork. Uh, but then you needed to start to, to winnow it. And the traditional way is throw it up in the air and let the air blow, let the wind blow the, the light stuff away and the grain falls back. Not very efficient, not uh, <laughs> very uh, efficient labor-wise either. So obviously let's find a way to do this better. And in the 1800s as things began to really mechanize, uh, the Industrial Revolution began in the late 1700s with the steam engine. And the farm was probably the last place that got much benefit from the Industrial Revolution. Uh, it was still ho literally horsepower out there. So one of the early attempts was what they call um, an apron style thresher. This type of a machine, S essentially you threw the stuff in, it kind of did the beating for you, the straw popped out the other end and the grain fell down. Not very efficient though. Uh, at best, these got about 80% of the grain. So you were throwing about 20% out with the straw. And got a couple horse to run it, so um, kind of the old style. But it was a beginning. Here in Battle Creek, uh, there were a couple guys, um, and it's actually a rather convolute story, so I won't go into all the details, but John Nichols and David Shepard eventually became partners. And uh, they had started out in a small blacksmith shop. Uh, Nichols had started that and uh, they started to build threshers. And things went pretty well. Man, they were building these little apron style threshers. Everything was great. And they improved their design and they got a lot of business. So they sold the old blacksmith shop. They just outgrew it. And it was just a few blocks from here. And um, they outgrew it and moved into a new facility on the east side of town. And it just became the big Nickel Shepherd factory over there. Uh, it was a good location. It was out of town, so they uh, didn't have any problems with the, the, the city and, and all of that, because uh, the city was growing like crazy then. And um, they sold their old blacksmith shop to one of the Merritt brothers. And they, the Merritt brothers uh, were the first, they, they were what, second and third people to come to Battle Creek. They bought half the town from Sands McCamley. So they were right there at the beginning of Battle Creek. It was kind of an interesting combination. This was the original Nichols and Shepard uh, uh, factory out there on the east side. And you can see they, uh, they had a huge factory for the day. They were being very successful. And they developed a style of um, uh, thresher called the vibrator. And that was because the, they had it so that the, the screens would vibrate back and forth. And this was 
something new instead of just the apron style where you just kind of let the straw go over, it got whacked at, and off it went. Now you actually tried to shake some of that loose grain out of the straw and it was much more efficient. They were getting up to uh, about uh, 89 to 90% efficiency. So this was a big step forward. Um, and uh, of course, nowadays you say, you know, you belong to the vibrator club, which they, they had for their employees. You kind of get a little smirk out of everybody. But uh, this, is where, <laughs> this is where it became a big, big thing in, in the uh, uh, day. And you can see this is, the feed area where the guy is sticking the straw. Uh, you can see the side levers here that would move the screens back and forth. They were all connected. And things would spit out the end and grain would come out, uh, out the other chute. About the same time, William Brown had a factory down on the mill race. Um, he was doing blacksmithing and, and uh, working on trying to develop a thresher. Um, and, and that location would be about the middle of the parking lot of the Kellogg Food Research Building now. Uh, that was the beginnings of the mill race down there. And a guy by the name of James Upton, uh, who was kind of a, he was a lawyer, a financier. Um, he, he was kind of, um, just kind of got his hands into everything. He bought part of the Brown factory and eventually bought Brown out. And Brown became the manager of his own factory eventually. But they were working on developing uh, their own style of uh, thresher and they came up with one where they took all of the good ideas from Nichols Shepard and a few of their ideas and combined it and they called it the combination. And that's the first time that any, any word like combine or combination got used uh, in, in the idea of threshing. Nowadays it means something entirely different, but uh, that was kind of his big thing. And by 1889 you can see what, what that had become, and you can see the cutaway version of that uh, feeding the, the uh, straw in here. The thresher is tumbling it all out, beating it up. The straw is going off this way. The grain's coming down here. Big fan artificial wind blowing the chaff out of it and the grain would trickle out on a chute that you could put in a bag. So it was a lot of, lot of equipment for, for the process, but it was very effective. So this was a, an ad that Nichols and Shepard ran to kind of show why their product was so much better. Up here in this middle one, you can see the thresher. It's kind of a big cylinder with teeth on it and it's going against a screen, a big grate, and it just takes that straw, beats it up, knocks the grain off, and then the straw comes up and comes along, and it was just a simple horizontal shaker grate, and the grain fell out and was collected, and they just kicked the, the straw out the back. What Shepard Nichols did was a couple of things. They increased the size of the, the cylinder, so they had a much larger cylinder, so it was in contact with the grate a much longer time. That was known as the concave because of its shape. And that made the threshing much more efficient. They also, instead of just having this shaking grate, they now had a section of grates that would do this, kind of whack it up. So it stirred the, sh the, the straw up and it became a much more efficient process. So they had their terms for it that they used in their advertising. And I'm not sure how they came up with these names, but the big cylinder. Well, it was much bigger than most, much more efficient. So, okay, that's a cool name. And what they did was they extended the grating of the concave up in the back and they called that the man behind the gun. And that was their trademark name for that. And then they had the steel-winged beater that kicked the straw out of there so it didn't clog up the threshing part of the machine. And then, of course, the beating shakers. So this became their um, trademark and their terminology. And that stuck uh, for um, a long time. <clears throat> and they finally put this all together and came out with a thresher that was the Red River Special. And it first had wood sides, and eventually, as it improved, it had all steel construction. Um, and this one, uh, you can see straw goes in there, and they have a special attachment here, which is the, uh, uh, the wind loader, and it, it would take 
uh, the straw and blow it out so you could put it into piles and uh, really improve the efficiency. These are some pictures uh, in the Nickel Shepherd factory of building some of the components. You can see here the, the cylinder being built. Uh, it was quite a process. Um, as you can guess, this was a pretty heavy piece of equipment and rotating at fairly high speed, so it had to be very well balanced. So throughout this process of shrinking the bands, heat shrinking them onto the, the cylinder, building up the teeth, inserting all this, it went through about three different stages of being balanced and rebalanced and rebalanced. It was, it was really actually more than just uh, dirty foundry work. It was pretty precision quality. And you can see the uh, thresher section being put into the, into the overall uh, uh, carriage there. So straw goes in one side with the grain. And on the other side, the straw comes out, the grain's all nicely separated, and off they go. So what do you do with all the straw? Well, it can be used loose for bedding for animals, so that would just get hauled off to the barn and just thrown in the barn. Or um, it could be tilled back into the soil, which was uh, to help the soil. Or it could go into this thing. This is actually an Oliver model, and this is a a uh, 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 hay compactor. It's kind of a forerunner to a baling machine. And <clears throat> you can see this arm here with this tooth-like thing, it, all it did was go like this. And just, you, this guy was shoveling the hay in while this thing was doing this. And then eventually a cylinder kind of pushed it out along this way. And then it had to be hand tied there. So can you imagine being the guy up on that machine with this thing going like this and the gears spinning? <laughs> this, was, this was probably the cause of more accidents on the farm than any other piece of equipment. Uh, things kind of changed out on the Great Plains. They really started to combine things. Here they have a combine. You can see the drive wheel here. It has about 34 horses pulling this thing. On the other side is a big arm that's the, the reaper arm, the cutting bar, and that's being pulled into the, the threshing part of the machine. And these men are taking the grain, putting it in sacks. The sacks come down here to be picked up. And it would take anywhere from 27 to 34 horses to pull this thing and took anywhere from five to eight men to operate. And it was doing 18 feet of cutting at a time. This was a pretty amazing piece of equipment. And you can see a couple pictures here from a little different angle. And you can see here the sacks of grain on the chute. And <clears throat> notice they've got a couple of these things going right along at the same time. I mean, there was a lot of wheat to cut out on the Great Plains. So here they had combined the reaping, the threshing, the separating, and the winnowing, and the sacking all into one machine as they went along. That got smaller and smaller over time. <clears throat> uh, as petroleum came on the market and tractors started to be developed, they became the prime source. Here they've got that big huge combine all down into a fairly small size. It's got its own motor to run it instead of a ground wheel, but this kind of became uh, more and more the type of equipment that smaller farms could begin to, to operate with. And by the end of the 20s, even Nichols and Shepard had taken their Red River Special and they had turned it into this, which you can't see it on the other side is the cutting bar and, and all of that, but they were uh, doing the same thing. Here's the, the thresher part, here's the cutting bar, the big grain tank up on top. And even after they merged with Oliver in 29, this is what they brought to that merger, was the Red River Special, the man behind the gun, the big cylinder, all that terminology still kept being used and still sold um, threshers as part of uh, the new Oliver combination. So uh, you can see them here. Uh, they've got a, a couple of flat cars full of these things ready to ship out to Nebraska. And notice the snow, it's there. that's here in Battle Creek. They're getting ready to ship. <laughs> 
After World War II, the trend continued to smaller uh, pieces of equipment, and now instead of having to have a separate engine, it ran off of the tractor with a power takeoff a PTO shaft. So uh, now smaller and smaller farms could begin to manage their, their crops and not have to have outside help come in to do it. Ironically, things are changing. It's going back to the big corporate farms again. And most of the reason for that is the cost of equipment. It's always been outlandish, but now it's really outlandish. This is kind of how modern combine works. This is, they've all kind of gone back to self-propelled units. Uh, cutting is done with uh, the, the reaping wheel up front, a sickle bar cutter. Augers bring it into a central uh, collection point, brings it into the, the thresher, the concave. All that's still there. The little winged beater, still there. The straw starts moving back here. The grain starts falling out. These things are just going like this, moving the straw toward the back and the grain down. You can see eventually that straw just exits the back of the machine, gets chopped up and spread out. The next layer is the grain. It collects on the pan. Again, notice it's kind of got these little teeth to kind of move it along and shake it. And it falls down to another pan, the big wind generator blowing the chaff off. So you actually have two streams of material coming out the back of the machine. And eventually uh, the grain is collected and brought up to the hopper up here. And everything that doesn't make it into the grain collection gets taken back up and put back into the thresher and it goes through the cycle again. So now we have machines that are incredibly efficient. Uh, John Deere, with the way they do things, they can get 99% grain recovery uh, today. And this is what it looks like, one of their, their big models. Notice you've got the straw coming out one and the chaff coming out in another, another uh, stream. The big tank grain hopper up top. Um, these guys cut a 33-foot swath now. Uh, 18 was kind of the big one in those horse-drawn models. You sit in an air-conditioned cab. You watch your computer screen. And as you're going along, it's telling you the efficiency at each stage of the process. You can adjust the size of the screens. You can change the distance between the concave and the thresher cylinder, all on the fly. So, and, and it's automatically doing that for you, just telling you what it did. It's an amazing piece of equipment. And you don't even have to stop to offload it. Here, they're going along. They are just augering the material from the grain tank off to a gravity dump tank being pulled by a tractor, and, and they don't even stop. These guys run these things 24-7 during harvest. Mm -hmm. The only time you stop them is to put fuel in them or to, to fix a, a problem. So we've really come a long ways. The other thing is the heads are interchangeable now. Because all the screens adjust and, and you don't have to swap out the innards of the machine, uh, all you have to do is snap on a different head and you can harvest a different crop. Here you've got a 16 row corn picker on the same machine. Uh, but they can now do all sorts of different crops, whether it's clover or soybeans or, or corn or alfalfa. I mean, the, you name it, they can do it. So they're, they're pretty amazing. They even have machines that'll go do rice. They take the wheels off, put tracks on, and off it goes. But this brings up the other part of the equation, and that's how do you power all of that stuff? Now they're big V8 diesel turbocharged engines. But back then, hey, we started out with those apron threshers with, with horses. And as things started to require more and more horsepower, uh, one of the things that uh, Nichols and Shepard did was they offered the triple gear horsepower. And what it was was a big sweep and you attached the, the horses to the sweeps and uh, it turned a gear cluster in the center and then that had a usually a propeller shaft or a belt and you dig a little trench and it'd come out here and connect uh, to, the, to the thresher. So you had this uh, way now of powering these things, but look at how cumbersome all this was. Uh, the Industrial Revolution, steam, it was the king, it was the motivating force. 
So the first uh, attempts to start mechanizing uh, the threshers, to start to power them with, with steam engines, was something like this. And this is a, just a portable steam engine. That's all it was. You can see that um, it still has the the T-bar the and the harness for, for the horses up front. It's even kind of got the, the typical wagon wheel sizes and the, you know, it's pretty much, it's, and it's just a boiler with a steam engine on top. And notice they've connected it with a big long belt. There was a reason for that. You have a steam engine, you're throwing wood into that fire or coal, there's a fire there mm -hmm. and you're there with all this flammable straw and, and grain and the dust is flammable and holy cow you don't want to be anywhere near that so from a safety standpoint they always set them back way far and this was the easiest way to connect them was just with the belt now the other thing you notice is notice how the belts crossed over here in the middle you had to do that if you didn't the belt would just start going up and down and flopping back and forth but if you crossed them over, one direction kind of canceled out the other direction and it didn't, didn't flop all over the place and come off the pulleys. So that's always done on purpose. It also helped if you did a Mobius strip type of thing, it also put the wear on both sides of the belt instead of just a single side. So this is kind of what a basic steam engine looks like. This is a wood coal burning steam engine. The back part here is the firebox. That's where you're throwing in the wood. You got the heat going. The center part is actually the boiler. That's where the water is. And through that are a series of tubes, hollow tubes, connecting the firebox to the smoke box up front. And so all the gas is being generated back here in the firebox then go through these tubes through the water and that way there's a lot of surface area so you can get that heat into the water a lot faster way more efficient and then here in the smoke box uh, it, the, uh, the, the gases would accumulate and go out the stack you'd have one of these guys in the stack it was a spark arrester because you didn't need all those sparks on the farm and what you do is to, when you started this up, you pull that out because it acted as a little bit of a block to the airflow. So to get enough draft up the chimney, you pull out the, the uh, spark arrester. And then once things were going and there was enough heat to kind of keep things going, then you could put the spark arrester back in. So that was kind of the early days of what a choke looked like for a steam engine, just kind of the opposite. So that was kind of how it worked and almost all of the designs were nothing more than a firebox, a boiler area, and a smoke box. Smoke stack to get the smoke, get things flowing, and a little dome to collect the steam. Pretty simple idea, and it was basically it didn't change any. This is a more vertical representation of that, but this is a guy by the name of Zebedee McComber. And in 1873, here in Battle Creek, this is what he built. All he did was he took a vertical steam engine, this is just kind of an area for fuel, put it on wheels and had a gear so the wheel would turn. And it was a one of a kind, he only made one, um, but it was the beginnings of things and people all around the country were kind of starting to do this. Uh, so to say it was invented here in Battle Creek is kind of saying, oh, it's like saying cars are all from Detroit. You know, it was happening all over the place, but Battle Creek became the place. Remember those Merritt guys that bought the Nichols and Shepard uh, blacksmith shop? Well, their specialty was actually running a foundry and doing machining. And they were noted for doing their ge for doing gears and casings and things like that. And they invented one of the next steam engines in the area. Uh, can tag it to the early 70s. Don't know quite when, but you can see kind of a rough picture. But again, it's got the wheels. Here's the flywheel. Um, you can kind of see the gears to drive the the rear wheel. Um, operating controls here in the back, but no driver platform, no way of really going along with it. You, you kind of had to walk and, you know, but 
they drove it up Maple, Maple Drive, and it worked just great. Went up the hill, came down the hill, no problems. And they started to try and sell them, and they found the best way to do this was to market them through the dealerships that Nichols and Shepard already had established, primarily in the West, and in California in particular. So Nichols and Shepard, who moved out and sold this business, sold this blacksmith shop to the Merritts, now the Merritts are making the steam traction engines and selling them back to, to Nichols and Shepard, who are selling them to the public. So it's just kind of the, <laughs> this circle. And this is what the Nichols and Shepard engine looked like. Hey, it looks kind of the same, doesn't it, right? It was just really the early Merritt engine, and they um, started selling it under the Nichols and Shepard name. There was a really smart engineer working for Nichols and Shepard, a guy by the name of Elon Augustus Marsh. Elon Marsh, that sounds kind of familiar nowadays, doesn't it? <laughs> he was kind of the smart guy back then. <laughs> and he was noted for a couple of things. He had developed uh, a reversing gear for the engine. So steam engines work differently than petroleum engines. You know, petroleum engines, you've got a cylinder with a spark plug, and all the combustion happens at the top of the cylinder. The cylinder goes up and down because of it. But with steam, with the cylinder, first you put steam into one side to drive the cylinder back, and then you put steam into the other side and drive the cylinder back the other way. So you're getting kind of two ways of, of using that energy in a steam engine. So a lot of different things you can do with steam. You can't do with petroleum. But this was the thing. This lever right here and this little gadget right there on the main shaft, you could pull that back and it would take the sliding valves for the, the engine and get them out of sync just enough so that instead of putting steam in on one side, it would start putting steam in on the back side and you could reverse the engine. The other thing that was kind of clever about this was these big, hulking, monstrous engines have no brakes. And you kind of go, wait a minute, how do you stop these things? You do it with the steam. You pull back on the reversing lever, and it'd be like trying to put your car, slam it into reverse to stop. Well, with steam, you can do that. So you could actually stop the engine, and you could hold it on a grade by having the steam coming into both sides of the cylinder. That was the way steam worked. So pretty clever. And Marsh was the, the guy that put this together. And Nickel Shepard started using it on their um, uh, engines. But Marsh had taken out a patent. But Nichols and Shepard went in and looked at it and said, oh, but you got a little problem with your patent, so we're going to use it anyway. Needless to say, they did not become best of friends. Mm -hmm. And Marsh uh, had done a couple other things, um, and it's a little hard to see. This is an older, uh, well, I should say a, a newer tractor. But if you notice all this stuff right here, that is a high-pressure steam pump. And as you're building all the steam and using the steam from the boiler, you're using up the water in the boiler, and you've got to replace that water. But it's under high pressure. So it used to be that you'd just have a steam siphon. You'd have a pipe going over the water tank, and it would just kind of suck up some water and put it into the, the boiler. But that was not very efficient, and you couldn't control it very well. So Marsh developed this high-pressure steam pump to feed the boiler while it was operating. And that became the standard for, for tractors after that. So he's got this reversing gear. He's got this pump. Nichols and Shepard's kind of, he thinks, stealing their idea. It eventually went to the Supreme Court. And he uh, said, I've had it. I'm leaving. And he left them. And he did even more damage by convincing one of his buddies there, a guy by the name of Menard Lefevre, to come with him. And they decided they were going to do something different. Nichols and Shepard was kind of interesting. One of the, the ways they got some of their funding was they uh, uh, partnered up with a company, uh, Altman and Taylor. Um, Altman, uh, now Taylor was a, a, a farm implement sales rep up in uh, Chicago. And he became friends with, with Nichols 
and the two of them uh, kind of started talking and Taylor ended up buying about a quarter of the Nickel Shepherd stock, gave him some operating capital. Altman uh, came in. Uh, Altman actually uh, owned part of Nichols and Shepard at one point. Nichols and Shepard owned part of Altman and Taylor at one point. Uh, after Nichols died, Altman became president of Nichols and Shepard. These two companies were just totally intertwined. Uh, Taylor Altman, uh, I'm sorry, Altman Taylor um, also built a vibrator threshers under license from, from Nickel Shepherd. So if you go down to Mansfield, Ohio, there's still the remains of some of the uh, Altman Taylor plants down there, but they were just almost one in one with, with Nickel Shepherd. We're going to come back to that later on. So here you can see the uh, threshing and notice the stack of hay back here. This, these guys have been busy. They've got the, the wind stacker uh, extended and they've been working hard. Um, this is a Nickel Shepherd engine and it's interesting because you can't see it because the, the engine is on, mounted along the side of the engine on the other side. It's a side mount and it's actually a two-cylinder engine. That was an easy way to increase horsepower on these guys. Uh, normally the cylinder would be on the top of the engine. But this, this uh, shows that they've done a lot of work. And notice all the guys hanging around. Mm -hmm. Even though they've decreased the number of, of people necessary, it just meant they could work faster. And feeding the machine was the big thing. So now you have all these people running around collecting sheaves, bringing them in, stuffing them in the machine right off the wagon instead of having to do all this uh, handling multiple times. Um, this was also an expensive bunch of equipment. Normal farms could not afford this. It was way beyond your basic uh, section uh, 78 acre farm. Uh, so these were, um, uh, if you've ever read uh, Steinbeck's book, The Reavers, uh, this is what they were. They, they basically were teams that owned a tractor and a thresher and all the uh, auxiliary equipment and they would go from farm to farm to farm uh, doing threshing. So you got on the list and you, you made sure you were doing okay. Um, and so they were essentially harvesting companies. And we do the same thing today with the big, big uh, combines and stuff. Most farms can't afford that stuff. Uh, the big John Deere, like I showed you in the earlier picture, starts around 250, 300,000. Starts, Go up, goes up to about a million two. So most farmers aren't going to afford that kind of, kind of equipment. So it started a whole different way of life. They also kind of began to realize that, you know, in the off season when you're not threshing, what are you going to do with this equipment to make it pay for itself? And the tractors started to get bigger so they could start doing plowing in the spring. And you can see here, this is a big nickel shepherd. This was actually the model, the picture we used for the addition to our mural outside. If you look kind of down in the bottom left, you'll see, a, you'll see this guy just pointed the other direction. And notice the plow, it's what they call a platform plow. Um, the tractor just hooked up to it with a chain. Uh, there was no, no fancy draw bar, no three-point hitch, no hydraulics. It just dragged this, this thing along. And uh, you can see the man standing back there. Uh, usually there'd be uh, one for every two or three plow bottoms, and um, they would be adjusting the things as they went across the field. So even during plowing season, you'd have a number of people working the equipment. Well, remember, remember Mr. Upton? You know Upton Ave here, named after him. Um, he uh, decided that, you know, he was building threshers. He needed to get in the steam traction engine business himself. And remember Elon Marsh and his buddy Menard Lefevre? Mm -hmm. They decided to go work for him. So all of a sudden now, they are developing a new steam traction engine for Upton. And this is what they what they developed. This became the quintessential model for steam traction engines. At this point, they'd all kind of had different homegrown qualities, but now all of a sudden, this is what a steam traction engine started to look like. It brought it all together. There was an operator's platform in the back. There was storage for fuel and for water, single 
cylinder generally uh, with a governor system, a flywheel, the power equipment, gearing, and uh, fairly rudimentary steering. But that was what it looked like. Well, Upton uh, really started to take off. I mean, he was doing great. And he had one problem, though. To get his steam traction engines loaded on the rail, rail cars, he had to drive them through downtown. I mean, he's only over here by the, the research center. I mean, it's not like he had far to go, but he had to go about three blocks through downtown to get them on the rail car. And he was getting all sorts of complaints from the citizens, from the city. The city was trying to get industry out of the downtown area. It was supposed to be commercial and residential. And he said, okay, can I put a rail spur into my factory? And the city denied it. They did not want another train going through downtown. And if you remember the days when downtown was nothing but rail lines, um, you can kind of see where they were coming from. But Upton just kind of said, okay, you want to be that way about it? And he started looking around. And Marshall heard that he was looking for some place to go. And they made him an offer that they would build him a brand new plant, bigger than the one he had. They'd put it on a rail line. They'd give him a 10-year tax break if he'd come over to Marshall and set up business over there. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> Same thing's going on today, isn't it? <laughs> well, before he could accept the Marshall offer, Port Huron came in and said, we'll build you a bigger plant. We'll give you a longer tax break. Come on up here. And he did. So he ended up going up there. So he only built traction engines in town for about five or six years at most. Um, the rest, uh, he went up to Port Huron, built farm equipment and Port Huron traction engines up there. And uh, he was in business up there until 1927, till the end of the traction era period. One thing that's kind of neat about these old traction engines that Port Huron built were the back wheels. And they've got kind of a neat scallop to them. The grousers, that's this, this raised uh, pattern here, were cast into the wheel. And the way they'd do it is they'd cast the hub and it would have these spokes already set into it so as the hub cooled it kind of contracted a little bit and really set those spokes in with and then they'd set it all up in the mold with the the spokes and they'd pour the out, outer rim of the wheel and when it cooled it just put all those spokes into tension and made for a very strong wheel it was a great wheel except for when you broke it <laughs> There was no fixing it. You have bought a new wheel. The other problem was, as these grousers wore off with use, you bought a new wheel. And because of the way they were made, those were expensive wheels. They were good, but they were pricey. So that was one of the things that Port Huron never got away from, but it also made their product a little more non-competitive in, in kind of a, an economic sense. So you can see one here. This was back in the days when they had to go and plow the streets after the winter to kind of get the dirt back on the road and out of the gutters. And you can see the steam traction engine pulling a single bottom plow to do that. Well, when Upton left Battle Creek, Elon Marsh and Menard Lefevre were basically they had it going. I mean, they were the head engineers. Um, they, they had everything that they needed. And they looked at Upton and said, you want us to move? Moving back then was a big deal. I mean, you know, we're in a society now where moving, uh, we do it every couple of years for the company. But back then, that was a big deal. And they said, we're not, we're not going. So they quit. Ironically, they had a couple people working for them that were young apprentices. They were the second year of their machinist apprentice. And they decided, well, you know, we came from Niles as kids. We've only been here two or three years. We don't really have anybody in town that we're, you know, really that fond of. Uh, and if we stop working for Upton, we're going to have to start our apprenticeship all over again. So they said, I'm not going to stay in Battle Creek. I'm going to go with Upton. And they were two of the very few people, few employees that moved. That was John and Horace Dodge of Dodge Motor Cars. 
So they kind of had their start here in Battle Creek, but left pretty quickly after that. And Horace always had a love of steam engines. And he got that because that was his apprenticeship at Upton, working on steam traction engines. That's where he learned. So after a couple of years, this new company that Elon Marsh and uh, uh, Menard Lefevre went to work for, uh, it was called Case and Willard. And they had just started up making their brand of threshers, looked a lot like everybody else's. And they started steam engines, and sure enough, their steam engine looked exactly like the one that Upton was making because Menard Lefevre basically designed both engines and Marsh did all the, the engineering on them. So it just kept, kept flowing. This was one of the early Case and Willard designs here. Uh, in 1883, um, the company changed its name to Advance and uh, now the Case and Willard design became the Advance design, and Advance was one of the big manufacturers here in town for years. So they were the Advance Thresher uh, Company of Battle Creek, and it's kind of neat because everybody always cast their name and location on the smoke door uh, at the front of the, the engine. So you can kind of track the history of these companies by looking at the smoke doors. And you'll notice also uh, they'd always have an a, a engine number that they'd cast, and that would be attached to the boiler section, usually kind of toward the back of the smoke box. Advance, for years, had a logo. It was known as the Banner Boy logo. And you can see uh, the uh, Scotsman with the flag advancing the troops forward. For some reason, um, Scottish uh, war battles were kind of a big thing in the 1800s, and people really clicked into the stories and, and, and used those for a lot of imagery. So um, that was kind of the way it was. Let me kind of take in a, a quick little tour of uh, Mason, Michigan. Uh, they have a steam traction show over there every year. And the Somerville family lives there. They uh, collect and restore uh, antique steam traction engines. Uh, they've got, I think, 11 advance uh, engines now, a couple of cases. But uh, the advance were all originally built here in Battle Creek. And this particular one is a, a 22 horse that was built here in Battle Creek in 1913. And uh, you can see they've got it all restored, got the Battle Creek name on there. And this is what it looks like. It's a huge engine, actually. It's uh, kind of your, your basic, typical looking engine. But this one's a straw burner. The boiler's set up just a little differently. Uh, what it has, you can see here at the top, it has the shelf that comes out, and that's part of the water jacket. And uh, this way, uh, you get more heat from bottom and top. So you can throw straw in there and burn the straw. And uh, oftentimes, that would be the way to fuel these things out in the field, was you've got all the straw, what are you going to do with it? Well, you throw it in the, and use it as fuel. But it did take a little bit of a different engine. You could still burn wooden coal in it, but uh, straw burners were an option. And that was something that Menard Lefevre invented here in Battle Creek. The big thing was water. You know, th these things were pretty fuel efficient, but it took uh, three gallons of water uh, for just about uh, every hour of operation. So they, they sucked up water pretty fast. You use steam really rapidly. And um, even though you condense, recondense some of it, a lot of it went up the stack to create enough draft to keep the, the, the fires going. So uh, everybody had to have a water hauler along with them. And uh, you can see the tank here. This is a water tank. You can see the pipe going up to the uh, high pressure steam pump. So you can kind of get a sense of how big this thing is by looking at, at uh, Jake Somerville here. Uh, pretty big engine. And, uh, They'd run these things at about 150 pounds. Well, that's when the uh, steam uh, safety valve would open. Uh, so they'd usually uh, run it at about 100. That would be normal. And um, you can get a sense of the, the size of this engine. Really, the whole thing that powered it was this section right here, the steam cylinder and the, and the crank. That was, that was the whole engine. All the rest of it was just to make steam to run the engine. 
The other thing is none of the bearings are lubricated like we have today. I mean, they're all self-sealed, self-lubricating bearings. The first thing you do before you run one of these things is you spend a half hour running around oiling everything. <laughs> Grease is your best friend. And this is, the, this is the lever. Push that forward and off you go. Pull it back, you're into neutral, braking, and then reverse. Notice there's the marsh reversing gear. Here's the belt drive up to the governor, and there's the governor. Steam engines, once they start either gaining speed or going speed, they kind of keep doing that. They just kind of have this positive feedback. So you're always having to readjust the speed. And a governor does that for you, so you're not always having to tweak everything and paying attention to that. And this governor works in such a way that as it turns faster, these weighted arms start to move out. And the further they go out, the more it shuts down the engine. They come back down, the engine opens up again. So it's kind of like a valve, a safety valve. And that's where the saying comes, uh, uh, if you're running uh, balls out, it means the governor is all the way up, the balls are in their max position, and you're running as fast as you can on the steam engine. Nowadays, people think there's a different meaning to that. <laughs> so you look at this big monster, and this is the little wheel that you crank around to steer the thing. And you go, my god, how do you do that without power steering? But it was all here in the way it was geared. The other end of that steering wheel is simply a little worm gear uh, driving a shaft that goes through here. Notice the chains counter. Uh, counter wrapped on the shaft so as one extends the other pulls in and notice what they call the skid ring here on the front wheel there's no differential on these things both wheels are geared and both are turning so they don't want to keep going in a straight line there's no way one wheel can turn a little faster than the other to take a curve that's what the differential in your car takes care of for you but these didn't have them. So to make these things turn was a little tricky. You really kind of, you know, they just kept wanting to go straight. So the skid ring helped to keep those wheels and get them to dig in a little bit and finally it'd go. The good news is, despite the fact that it didn't want to turn, it didn't have brakes, nothing happened very fast. These things only did about four to six miles an hour at most, so you had plenty of time to do things to try and try and make it behave. So this was kind of the typical setup you'd see running around the country. There'd be a traction engine pulling a thresher, pulling a crew shanty or cookhouse. Uh, there'd be a guy with a wagon for bringing in the sheaves. There'd be a, a water tanker in the in the process. So these would be going from farm to farm to farm, and. You know, they're traveling at four to six miles an hour, which is probably a pretty good thing. This was a pretty good road back then. And you can see that it would just be all over the place. So there's no way you'd want to be traveling that very fast. And they just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger to work the, the plows during the, the plowing season. This is a 25 horse that the Somervilles have. And look at the size of this thing. It's a monster. And notice the, the rim extensions back here to get more traction on the ground for plowing. Big flywheel. Normally, when you see traction engines, they give you two numbers for horsepower. The first one's the big number, and that's the one taken off the flywheel. The second is the number at the drive wheel on the ground, and that's the small number. So, uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of energy gets used up in those gears, getting it back there. Typical platform plow. The guys would be standing here, you know, continually changing things as you hit a rock or whatever. And uh, you can see a case here. Uh, this was over at Mason this summer, and they were plowing. And you can see all the guys on the platform plow. The tractor is making steam. They've got the firebox really fired up, and uh, man, black smoke pouring out of the thing. Every time the, the exhaust uh, steam hits, it's funneled back out through the funnel, through the smokestack to help get that draw going and really get that fire heated up. So by the time you stop this thing, 
you've got this roaring fire. You're making a whole lot of steam and the steam gauge is just cre creeping up and all of a sudden you're not using steam anymore. You're sitting still. So very quickly you'll hit the upper limit and the steam valve will open and you just see this gush of steam coming out of the top and just kind of... <laughs> And our old saying, you know, he's all wound up, he's letting his steam off. That's, that's where it comes from. Rumley Company down in LaPorte, Indiana, uh, made large plowing tractors. That was their specialty. But they didn't have threshers. And they really were kind of looking to get into that business. And they looked around and, ooh, there's Advanced Thresher up there in Battle Creek. But Advance is having a little financial problem. 19, uh, 1893, there was a big market crash that made 2008 look pretty mild. And then in uh, 1906, there was another market crash. So there were some economic cycles that were really taking their toll on these companies. And Advance was kind of a little wobbly. So Rumley came in and bought Advance, and it became the M. Rumley Company. And notice the Advance name went off the, the smoke box door, and they still wanted to keep the Advance um, idea, the connection, so they used the Banner Boy logo as their, their casting. Rumley uh, acquired um, Advance. Uh, in, in late 1911. And he also then, or quickly the next year, developed what he called Rumley Products Company. So all the, all the sales and marketing, he had the separate company that took care of Advance and Rumley Products. And uh, Menard Lefevre did not like this idea a whole lot. He um, uh, was by now superintendent of all of the works here in Battle Creek. And he and Rumley did not see eye to eye, and it, Menard Lefevre left abruptly and went off to California with his family. And his house here stood vacant for years. It was up on what's now Liberty Park up there on the corner of uh, Rittenhouse and Washington, that, that empty lot with the stairs going up the, the sides. Um, so he just, he kind of disappeared. His, his great grandson, Skip Sheriff of Sheriff Gosselin Roofing is still here in town though. Uh, but that kind of was a big change. Uh, Marsh went on, he left, he went on and did Marsh Pump, uh, which uh, merged with American Pump and became Union Pump, I, I think, is in the end. Um, but, you know, here, a couple years later, financial difficulty hits Rumley. He's kind of scampering around. And he goes into receivership. The receiver says, okay, you're going to keep building steam traction engines in Battle Creek. The new petroleum oil tractors you're going to build down in Laporte, kind of two separate entities, and uh, Advanced Rumley was created out of that. So Battle Creek continued making steam traction engines, which by now are kind of on their way out. And you can see this one again. Notice the snow. And. Down in Laporte, Indiana, they made the Rumley oil pull. This was a very successful venture for them. Um, Rumley was one of the first to figure out how to put together a carburetor that could handle low grade like kerosene. And back then it wasn't as good a grade, it varied a little bit. So you really had to be able to handle a lot of different grades of fuel. And, and this could do it. And it turned out to be a pretty, pretty good tractor for them. All the engine is back in here. All of this is simply fuel tank and radiator. And instead of being cooled with like water and coolant, it uh, was used oil to, to uh, cool. So uh, that was one of the things. So this is going on in 1923. Remember Altman Taylor, the guys that Nichols and Shepard were so tight with? Well, they were getting into trouble. Altman had died, his daughter inherited the company, and she didn't have a clue as to what steam traction engines were. And steam traction engines were getting a lot of competition from those petroleum tractors now. And mismanagement, the company was going down, so Rumley decided to buy them. So now, instead of Nichols and Shepard buying them, Rumley bought them. So they ended up here in Battle Creek anyway. First thing Rumley did was close the company and just take the repair business. So 
The Vance Rumley is going along, but by the time you hit engine number 15277, you're into the last 30 of the engines that they push out of the shop. That's pretty much it. Uh, and uh, you can kind of see the end coming. Uh, here you can see a Nichols and Shepard steamer and a Rumley oil pull pulling this house. And it kind of says, ooh, the transition is happening. The steamers are big, they're heavy, they don't work well in wet fields or small bridges. Uh, they take a lot of men to run. It takes an hour and a half to get one fired up before it can move. An oil pull, boy, you go out, you spin the crank, one person can go off and start working. The writing was on the wall. Altman Taylor kind of tried to do what Romley did with the, the oil pull. Much bigger tractor. Here's the engine part, the radiator up front. But it's a big tractor. And big tractors weren't the market anymore. Things were changing. Engines, which were kind of the old steamers that looked like railroad engines, that terminology was fading out. And now the new oil tractors were becoming called tractors. And finally, Hart Parr started advertising tractors in the 1920s and made it official. They used the name, and that's all they used. And then Henry Ford. Henry and his son Edsel, outside of Ford Motor Company, started this little venture to build a farm tractor. Dodge Brothers, who were part of the Ford Corporation at that time, were very upset about this. And you can see here, it became the perfect little tractor. You could use it around a small um, quarter acre farm, the typical homestead. This was a family farm tractor. You didn't need a big crew. You could afford it. It was down to the price of what, where a Model T was, uh, you know, for, for tractors. It was still pricey, but notice the front wheel isn't lined up in the furrow. Um, notice the lady driving it doesn't have a smudge on her white dress <laughs> or her shoes. And, uh, so it, this is definitely a publicity photo, but it says it all. The market was going to small tractors that were easy to operate by the single farmer. Rumley tried to copy it, follow suit. They came out with this model that actually was a really good tractor. And it kept them going, helped them out. Nickel Shepard, on the other hand, just kind of rewarmed the frame of their old steamer. You can see this is a massive frame. Petroleum engines back here. Fuel tanks are up here, right near direct line of sight. And here is the radiator. And unlike the um, Hart Par or the, the Rumley that had a stack where it all went up vertical, here's the, the fan blowing it all back right into your face. It was poorly thought out. It was a tractor that had a lot of mechanical problems. Um, they had a real reliability issue with it and with hitting just at the time that the family farm smaller tractor idea was coming in man this just didn't work it, it lasted about a year on the market and they took it off they had a gap in their their line now they didn't have any small tractors and that was where the market was so they made a deal with Alice Chalmers to market their small tractors Nickel Shepard had a great dealership, a great network, but they didn't have any product. Well, Alice had the products, so they started marketing Alice Chalmers tractors, uh, and they also made a deal with a Lawson tractor uh, up in uh, Wisconsin, and they marketed Lawson-built Nichols and Shepard tractors. Kind of looks like the Rumley uh, attempt, doesn't it? And that was carrying them, but boy, they were in the wrong spot at the wrong time on their marketing. In 1911, Oliver Company, it was the Oliver uh, Chilled Plow Works at that time, and uh, they did a, a, a farm bureau test where they had a 50 bottom plow, 50 furrows at a time. And they ran it twice. They did it once with uh, oil pull tractor, three oil pull tractors, and another time with three international uh, tractors, uh, moguls. And uh, Oliver got a little bit of publicity out of it. 
this plow was never anything practical. It, was, it wasn't never going to be sold. You couldn't turn the thing around at the end of a field. But um, they got a lot of good publicity for the fact they had the capability of producing this kind of equipment. But who really got the benefit out of it was Rumley. Their tractors pulling this 50 bottom plow, it was great for them. International didn't capitalize on it. So, 1929, we all know what happened then. That was the stock market. And Nichols and Shepard was out of step with things. They were teetering. And it turns out that about this time, all the farmers wanted a single dealership to deal with. They wanted tractors, implements, everything from one dealership. That was the new trend. So Oliver chilled plow works. Nichols and Shepard for threshers. American Seeding Machine for obvious seeders. And Hart Park Tractor Company, which had the mid and small tractor range. They merged together to form a new corporation to meet all these new market demands. And they called it Oliver. And it wasn't until 1960 the White Motor Company bought out Oliver. That closed everything here in Battle Creek that November. And then in 1991, uh, White Tractor Line was spun off. It was acquired by a company known as Alice Gleaner Company, and it was formed by some executives from uh, Deutsche Alice. And it was known as Agco. And uh, all of the white equipment was rebranded then as Agco. So that's kind of the history of what happened to Nichols and Shepard through Oliver, through White, and now Agco. About the same time, uh, Alice Chalmers had a problem because they were being sold through Nichols and Shepard. But now Nichols and Shepard had Hart Parr as part of their Oliver merger. They didn't need Alice anymore. So Alice starts going out to look for somebody that's got a dealer network that they can sell their product. And who do they find? They find Advance Rumley. Advanced Rumley at that time had 24 branch offices and 2,500 dealerships. So it was perfect. So Alice Chalmers bought Advanced Rumley. And guess what? In 1985, Alice Chalmers gets sold to a German group, Deutsch AG. Does that name sound familiar? And in 1989, that agricultural group was spun off to a company called Alice Gleaner Corporation Agco. So now all of a sudden, Rumley, Advanced Rumley, Nickel Shepherd, two of the biggest competitors here in Battle Creek, all end up eventually in the same company through a couple of mergers down the road. And now everything's going back to big corporate farms. It, it was kind of the, the signs were coming in the 60s, you know, that things were getting a little bigger. The cost of equipment was driving it. By the 90s, if you didn't have at least 1,600 acres under cultivation, you weren't going to make it. Now, if you have less than 2,500 acres under cultivation, good luck. And the equipment got bigger and bigger and more expensive in, in pace. Interestingly, the one company that made it through all of this ups and downs and made the right calls Nothing runs like a deer. So that's history of threshers and steam traction engines in Battle Creek. And it provided a lot of jobs and a lot of money into this city for 60, 70 years. Good luck finding much of it now. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> talks about a guy that built a thresher and he sent him all the way around to Cape Hope and all the way back to California. Yeah. Did, did you ever read that thing? I, you know, I have never stopped and looked at that. I, I think it's on my list of things to do though. Yeah. <laughs> Now, there, there were, there were, you know, I, I've just kind of touched on the highlights of what was going on here. There were a lot of people involved and a lot of companies that, that were involved that were subsidiaries to these guys. So, yeah, I, I need to go look at that. Yes, sir. I think that 
Bill, I heard there's something about uh, one of the first threshers was demonstrating climax and it burned in the field. Oh, yeah. And yeah, that, part about that. that was a big problem with the early threshers because they didn't have ball bearings. They, they all just had bronze bushings. And if you didn't keep those things lubricated like every 20 minutes or so, you would overheat a bushing because in that big cylinder in particular, that was a lot of mass that you were turning. And those bushings would overheat and they would, in the sides of the uh, threshers were built out of plywood, or uh, kind of what looked like plywood. And man, they'd go up in flames with, with all the wheat and straw and <laughs> everything that was there. They were real susceptible to fires. And that was not an uncommon occurrence. <laughs> the line that was built uh, through Battle Creek into Mansfield, Ohio, was that tied in for the railroad line? Was that tied into any of this at all? Yeah, Altman Taylor was right on that line. They had they, a spur they, right they off of built, it. Did it. Uh, the bed got built, but did the line get built? Uh, so they, they didn't finish the whole line, but part of it was done, and the early um, Mansfield part was done down there, but it wasn't wasn't up here. Yeah, they had to get back into the regular the bed's system. All still down through the Harper Creek. Yeah, you yeah. See the bed where it was built. Yeah, yeah. This end never quite quite made it. The problem is they were going through a lot of railroad consolidation up here, so there wasn't a driving force for it. There was enough open trackage. Uh, uh, that they could use, and it just yeah. economically didn't compete. Yeah, that lands all, you know, sectioned off even today. Oh yeah, yeah. Of that only. Yeah, it's amazing how when you forget about things and things stop, you don't really worry about what's going to happen. It just sits. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool. For the, uh, I've got photos of the plates. Yeah. Okay. But I thought you said they weren't built down there. Was that, did they just cast? Um, the when, um, when Rumley first took over um, ba the uh, Battle Creek Works in 1911, they started casting M. Rumley Company and the Banner Boy. Um, a couple years later, when he had to reorganize, it became Advanced Thresher Laporte. And uh, when they uh, started running into some financial problems and reorganized again, and the Rumley Production Company went away, um, they changed the logo again and they took off the Laporte part and it was just advanced, uh, advanced Rumley Threshers and sometimes they put on Battle Creek and sometimes they didn't. It, it just kind of depended on when, when they had to make a new mold <laughs> or, or you know, a new, new pattern for the mold. Yeah. But a lot of the times you'll see numbers on the, the front plates also, and people often take those as dates, but they're not. They're part numbers. So you have to be a little careful, because some of them look like they should be dates, but they're, they're actually part numbers. And you can kind of look at the different part numbers and get a, a feel for the sequence that they should be in, starting from the lower numbers to the higher numbers. Yeah. Yes? I was curious if these machines were exported to Europe or to other oh, countries. Oh yeah. Oh absolutely, it's yeah. Interesting. Yes, Michigan is was sort of a frontier state even back in these days. Yeah. And yet uh, we had um, the oak stoves going, you know, uh, to the biggest mm -hmm. in the whole world. Is, yeah. And here you have this amazing development here. So it was influencing yeah. agriculture in Europe. Absolutely. They, they exported these around the world. Um, and actually, very few of them were sold right along, right around here. Uh, the biggest market for them was the Great Plains and California. Uh, and then, of course, they, they traveled the world. Uh, yeah. The, I mean, they had 10% of the global market. <laughs> it's just amazing. Yeah. I mean, very few companies can, can say that. You know, Henry, Henry Ford's one of the few that can say he had about 1.50% of the car market. But that, those, those figures are just outrageous. <laughs> I've seen old postcards and now it makes sense where they had the teeter-totter for the steam engine. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's why I didn't realize. That was one of their sales gimmicks. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. They did on a teeter-totter with that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yes, sir. The building, uh, paper mill I work at on Angel Street, uh, the 
paperware, <coughs> paperware households, the old auto manufacturing plant. Ah, okay. Oh, okay, they, yeah. They still bring in the rail cars for the paper mill. That for the paper mill, yeah. Oh, that's neat. I, I wasn't aware that there was much of the old Oliver plant still standing. Yeah, no. yeah. In the paper warehouse, there's all kinds of little scales. Big scales, 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 scales. Yeah. Oh, neat. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> you were the stuff up at Charlton Park. Uh, Charlton Park. Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. They do, they do a, a show every summer up there. There's also um, Scott's Mills Park out here by Climax. They, they keep some uh, equipment out there and do a show there a couple times a year if they can. Our kids were hiking in uh, where is it, Smoky Mountains. And one of the trails, right over the trails, is, there's still an engine. They just abandoned it. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Not, not surprising. They, they used a lot of them, uh, especially toward the end of their lives, uh, not for field work, but they uh, used them as stationary power, just steam engines running uh, sawmills, sawmills and things like that. They yeah. just abandoned it. It's still there. got Battle Creek right on it. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> I'm not sure what trail it is. Well, that, that was one of the thing about these, these things. They were just built to last. They were simple. They were overbuilt like nobody's business, all cast iron and steel. And it kind of killed their own market in a way because they never wore out. You, you know, they, they just, and they didn't change that much. So it wasn't like you had to have the newest, greatest model every year. You just, they just kept going. And it was really the petroleum engine that kind of was their demise, changed the markets on them. You know, I believe so, the original. You can, you can find prints of this all over the place. Okay. Uh, there's actually one of these hanging in the entranceway from the parking garage over at Bronson Hospital okay. in Kalamazoo. Okay. But yeah, he, he was the original, yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Well, great. Well, thanks for coming, everybody. And take a look at the mural out there. We're still finishing up the, the last bits of it, but uh, go out and find the Nickel Shepherd steam traction engine out there. <laughs> Thank you.